Hello everyone. In this video, we're still on chapter 9, just in the development, but we're going to talk about cognitive development. Now, I want to point out that cognitive development uh, has to do with our mental actions. Our cognition is all our mental actions, our ability to acquire knowledge. Uh, the short, short definition when you are thinking about it, cognition is our ability to be smart. Um, think about logic, your reasoning skills, your understanding. How does that get better over time? How does that develop over time? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about cognitive development. Now, uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about Piaget's stages of cognitive development. I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of that. And I'll talk a little bit about post-formal operations. Uh, the next theory is going to be Wyckowski and how uh, culture and family affect cognition. And the final theory I want to talk about is Colbert's moral development. Um, so I'm going to start here with Piaget. Piaget was a Swiss psychologist who studied children. And some of his first studies were on his, first, on his own children. Um, and he started to see that there was a difference in the way children thought. Uh, before Piaget, people really did believe that children were just tiny adults. And when you told a six-year-old to do something and they did it wrong, or in the middle of it, they got distracted and started doing something else, people really believed that that little kid was doing it on purpose, that he was trying to be uh, mischievous. Um, and that, you know, you had to beat the devil out of him. It's a phrase that people used to use uh, because they really believed that children were trying to do bad things on purpose or wrong things on purpose. Piaget comes in, other researchers like him come in, and we start to realize that children, in fact, don't think like adults. They don't really have all of the skills necessary. And when they're young, they barely have any of those. Uh, now, what you're seeing here is a small chart of uh, what I'm going to talk about sort of at length here. And you'll see that there are uh, the first four stages. Those are uh, Piaget stages. Sensory motor stage, the pre-operational stage, the concrete operational stage, and the formal operational stage. Um, that last one that you see there, the post-formal state, is not part of Piaget's original theory. But more modern research suggests that people do develop into this last stage, although there is a sort of back and forth still uh, among researchers. Does this stage occur for everybody? Can everybody get here? Um, is it just a cultural difference? Uh, what are we seeing there? But I am going to talk about it because it is sort of important to us and to you in this part of your life. So uh, I am going to begin here with Piaget's first stage, which we call the sensory motor stage. Here the child is just born, they're an infant, all the way to around two years old. It was important to understand about uh, the sensory motor stage is that children uh, in this stage, cannot control their mind on their own. Things are happening in their mind. Things are happening in their brain. These kids can touch, hear, taste, see things. Their brain is learning to categorize things, is internalizing a lot of new knowledge, but they can't control that. They can't say, you know what, today I want to learn this. Or what was that thing I thought about yesterday? Let me see if I can go back to that. They can't do that in their mind. Their mind is just sort of working. Think of a computer that's just taking in information. The computer, unless you write a program, can't make decisions about the information it's taking in. And sure enough, that's exactly what's happening here with the sensory motor child. Now, this kid is not dumb by any stretch of the imagination. These kids are actually uh, quite interesting in... Uh, there uh, was happening cognitively. They're learning a lot of things. 
language will eventually emerge here, um, expectations about how the world works. For example, if you drop something, a child expects that something to fall to the ground in the sensory motor stage. And if it doesn't, if you play like a magical trick on them and whatever you dropped stays hovering in the air, you'll notice that that child is interested. They'll stare longer. They'll sometimes even make faces because they're surprised by it. Because in fact, these kids actually have cognitive sophistication, but they, it is not to the adult level yet. Uh, also at around 18 months, kids start to develop self-awareness. Um, they start to realize that they are themselves somebody separate from the people around them. So I'm going to show you a quick video of how we uh, study that or how we can see that occur. This is known as a mirror self-recognition test, which may offer clues about the development of self-awareness. Without alerting the child, a mark is placed on his forehead. A baby. A baby. Usually a baby younger than about 18 months doesn't make the connection between itself and the person in the mirror. The child may even look behind the mirror for the stranger it sees. Hi. But by about 18 months, there's a change in the child's awareness. Now it notices the red dot and the link between itself and the image in the mirror. What's that red? Right, and so what's important there is that the child uh, before uh, excuse me. Before 18 months, doesn't even recognize themselves in the mirror. Um, you'll notice your dog does this as well. Dogs don't have uh, self uh, awareness, really self recognition. And so the dog will see themselves in the mirror, and sometimes they'll bark at the mirror, or sometimes they'll just ignore the dog inside the mirror. But unlike a dog, at around 18 months, your child will start to pay attention to the person in the mirror. They'll know that's me there. That's not a different person. You saw the little kid say hi to his reflection in the mirror. After 18 months, the child doesn't assume that's somebody else. 
the child know that that is in fact him or her. Um, there are some animals that can do this too. Um, chimps, uh, gorillas, um, a lot of sort of the greater apes or the great apes. Um, the elephants can do this. Uh, magpies, which are a type of bird, can do it. Um, we think that animals like dolphins can do this, but it's hard to do a rouge test on a dolphin. Okay. Uh, so again, sensory motor stage, here the child still cannot manipulate their mind. Now, at the pre-operational stage, uh, now the child can control their mind. Uh, they are going to learn a lot of things here. Uh, obviously, they learned object permanence and self-awareness. Um, here, they've learned language, and right around two, they start learning language really, really fast. That's what fast mapping is. Um, and uh, they have already started uh, not only playing, uh, which starts early, but cooperative playing, uh, which uh, means they're, they're playing with somebody else. They are, uh, sort of maybe have goals in their play. Uh, they interact, etc. And they're going to learn a lot more things at the pre-operational stage. They're going to understand numbers. <clears throat> I'll talk about private speech a little bit later. They'll understand uh, gendering, so they'll know what gender they are. Um, they'll eventually learn that gender is stable and constant, that it will not change later on, or that it doesn't change just because you put on you know, a tie or because you put on mom's high heels. Um, <clears throat> and uh, children will also learn what we call theory of mind. That will happen around four years old. This is a little bit of a misnomer. I don't love this term. Theory of mind isn't the scientific theory of mind. It's the child's theory about mind. Um, in other words, the child starts to realize that they think differently than others, and also that they may have knowledge that other people don't have. And again, that other people have knowledge that they themselves do not have. Uh, now, um, you'll see there that there's a, a column that says interferes. At the pre-operational stage, children actually uh, can think uh, on their own. Their mind is working. They can control their thoughts and their memories. You could ask a three or four year old, what did you do yesterday? And they'll be able to tell you where uh, that one and a half year old is not going to be able to tell you that very well. You're going to ask them, what did you do yesterday? And they're going to tell you something random. I went to Disney, even though you know they did not go to Disney yesterday. Um, because they can't control their own minds at one year old. But by uh, three, four years old, um, they're going to be able to express uh, memories. And as they get older, they're going to be able to tell you memories that happened maybe even last year. Um, but that will also take time. However, their logic is not very good. Their logic is consistently being interfered with because they don't know how to use the world inside of their mind just yet, the tools inside of their mind just yet. And so I'm going to begin here with centration. I'm going to show you a video about that, and then I'll come back to some of the others. Um, centration is something that interferes with a child's logic. When you look at these two glasses, do you think that they have the same amount of juice? Do you think they're the same? Okay. Now we're going to pour this juice into this glass. Now, do you think that this glass has more juice? This glass has more juice? Or do you think that they have the same amount? That one. This one has more? And why do you think that this one has more? Because it's not it's a taller. Is centration. 
uh, or at least one of the things we see is intuition. Um, the child can only focus on one major variable. And what she's focusing on is that it's taller. It's also thinner, but that's too complicated for a child at the pre-operational stage. Um, and so therefore, she just focuses on it's taller. And so therefore, it must be more. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, she saw the liquid inside of the beaker. So why doesn't she just sort of think in her mind, if I were to put this water back in the beaker, it would be the same level. Uh, because this child can't reverse their own thoughts. That is a tool that you have that the child does not have. Once it's happened, the liquid has been poured into the cylinder, the child can't go back and say, oh, this liquid was the same level in the beaker. It's just too complicated for the child. And so they go, it's taller. But now you're going to see uh, a slightly older girl, I believe, in the picture. Okay. So this girl is older. She's at the concrete level. And so you're going to see the difference of how an, uh, an older child can do this uh, task, what we call a conservation of math task. Um, because this child at the concrete operational state, their logic isn't being interfered with by filtration. So first we're going to look at these two cups right here. Do you think there's the same amount of juice in this glass as there is in that glass? There even? Okay. So we're going to take the juice from this glass and pour it into this one right here. So now we're going to look at this glass and that. So do you think that there's more juice in this glass? Or just in this glass, or do you think that they have the same amount? Same amount. Okay, why do you think that they have the same amount? Just because it's a skinny doesn't mean it, it's the it's same amount. That's the amount. I mean, it, it has the same amount of juice in it, but it, this one is just wider, this one's skinnier, but they have the same amount. You'll notice that this child did both the things that the previous child could not do. Uh, they were not being stopped by centration. So this child uh, said, this one is skinny, but this one is wider. That's why it looks different. And you also no saw that she was doing reversibility in her head. At some point, she grabbed the empty beaker and she says, it has the same amount. And he kind of points to the empty beaker. And what she's saying is, in my mind, I know that if I were to put it back, the juice back into the beaker, it would look the same. Uh, so again, you're seeing that this child can do both reversibility um, and is not being uh, interfered with by centration. Let me show you another child who's going to be affected by centration. This next girl is at the pre-operational stage, like just like the first one. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters? Or do they have the same? One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. They're the same? Five, five. Okay. Now you'll notice that this little girl has a great tool to determine if they are the same. She counted them. So she understands uh, numbering very well and amounts. Um, but now you're going to see what the adult does and how concentration completely destroys her ability to do logic. Okay, so we're going to look at this one right here. Does this row have more corners? Does this row have more or do they have the same? That one has more quarters? Yeah. Why does this row have more quarters? Because 
it's far, it's more far away. So there you see, it looks bigger. When the lines looked similar, she went for a good tool, she counted them. But when one line looked bigger than the other, she was completely confused by that. And she went, the bigger line has to have more, that's why it's bigger. Now, you also notice that the adult moved the quarters in front of her face. It's not like she hid. She did it right in front of her face. And you might think, wait, why doesn't the little girl just sort of think to herself, uh, well, if I were to put the quarters back the way they were, they would be the same. Because of reversibility, this child cannot do that. This child cannot reverse the uh, objects in her own mind. And so therefore she's stuck just looking at what's in front of her, at the concrete world in front of her. Uh, uh, excuse me. And so therefore um, uh, she gets stuck with it because it's bigger. I'm going to show you a, just uh, the same little girl in another video. Uh, All right, we're going to play a game with the grandpa, and we're going to share them between me and you, okay? Because we both have two. Again, the child is only focusing on one variable, that's centration. Uh, the variable being, we both have two. Now, sure enough, if that girl was able to do reversibility, she would look at her own cookie and say, um, no, mine is really just one broken in half, um, and you have two full ones. But she can't do that. It's too complicated in her mind to do that. Okay. Um, now, uh, you'll notice here in interferes, there's a couple of other things that interfere in a child's mind with their logic. One of them is appearance of reality. So kids at this stage get stuck um, in uh, whatever they're looking at or whatever they see in the real world. Um, and they can't manipulate the information very well in their mind. And so they think that whatever they see must be real. You might have noticed this if you've ever worn a scary mask in front of a two to around seven year old, they get scared. And even if you take the mask off and say, look, look, it's me. When you put the mask back on, they're still scared. They get scared of you because they can't think in their mind, oh, that's really Johnny behind that mask. The whatever is in front of them, they just feel that it's real and they get scared of it. Little kids will sometimes do weird things like you give them a cup of milk and they'll put on some sunglasses, sunglasses and say, oh, I like chocolate milk better. And because the sunglasses make the milk look brown, they think they're drinking chocolate milk. And they'll say things like, mm, I love chocolate milk so much. Uh, when in reality, they're not drinking chocolate milk. It only The milk only looks brown because they're wearing sunglasses. In animism, uh, the child believes that inanimate objects have traits of living things. So the child knows that, for example, the couch is not alive. The child basically understands the, child, the, the couch isn't going to have baby couches. The, uh, the child understands that the couch doesn't have a heart, for example. Um, but if they bump into the couch, they might say that the couch is being naughty, um, that the couch should get in trouble for it. 
because they believe that inanimate objects have certain human or traits of uh, of living things. And that last one, artificialism, is another thing that interfered with children's logic at this stage. Uh, in artificialism, children believe that everything was made by a person. And they'll say things like, who made the moon? Or who made that mountain so high? Or uh, you know, things like that. Because they assume that everything must have been made by a person. Um, okay. uh, now, in the third stage of Piaget, uh, cognitive stages, is the concrete operational stage. Now here the child has learned all the things from the previous stages. And they're going to learn a lot better things. They're going to get uh, better memory techniques. Uh, they're going to become quite intelligent. And in fact, during this stage, around 7 to 11, is when you start hearing parents say things like, my kid is so smart. And then they'll tell you something completely mundane that their child did. Um, but the reason it feels to the parent that this child is so smart is because just a little while ago, the kid was getting tripped up by very simple things. And now all of a sudden, it, they're brilliant. They're using really complex logic. They are remembering things really well. Um, they might even correct you because they are, uh, in fact, uh, using their brain quite uh, well. But they still have problems. And the biggest two problems is that they're going to have issues with hypothetical and abstract thinking. So at 7 to 11, the child is going to have a hard time, let's say, solving for x in, a, in an algebra um, study uh, or an algebra uh, exercise. Um, and they're going to have sort of a hard time uh, if you ask them a hypothetical question, you know, given these ideas, what would happen, blah, 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 um, that they're going to have a hard time holding those things together because they can't hold um, hypotheticals or abstracts in their mind. Let me show you a video of this. In this video, they're going to give the child uh, two rules, and then they're going to ask them what happens next. Given these two rules, what's going to happen? And you're going to see that this first child at the concrete operational stage can't really do it. They are always going back to the way things work in the real world, not in the hypothetical. It says, if you hit a glass with a hammer, the glass will break. <laughs> and then this one says, Don hit a glass with a hammer. So what happened to the glass? It broke. It broke. Why did it break? Because the hammer's hard. You'll notice that he said, because the hammer is hard. Meaning, I know what a hammer is, he's thinking. Hammers are hard. And in the real world, in the concrete world, hammers can break glass. And so... He's not thinking about the hypothetical at all. He's not thinking about the rules at all. Now, this becomes more obvious when you give him a, a hypothetical that doesn't actually fit in with the real world. If you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. And this is the second rule. Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened to the glass? Nothing happened. Why didn't anything happen? So now here it's more obvious that the child is not paying attention to the rules, the um, uh, abstract or hypothetical rules. He's just going by what's happening in the real world. And again he says, because a feather is soft. In the real world, a feather couldn't break a glass just by hitting it. And so therefore, uh, he can't imagine this abstract thinking. Now, the next girl you're going to see is a girl who is older than 11 or 12, because uh, and, and she is in uh, what we would call the formal stage, the last stage, according to Piaget. Okay. Uh, the 
first one says, if you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. And the second one, Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened to the glass? It broke. <laughs> and why did it break? Because they're all feathers. If you hit a glass with a feather, it breaks. So if you hit a glass with a feather, it broke. It says, if you hit Okay, and so you see that Sheen is very capable of doing the abstract thinking. She's almost exhausted by it, like, oh, what a simple thing to ask me, it's so silly. Um, but she doesn't say anything about the real world. She says, because the rules say in this abstract game we're playing, um, or hypothetical game we're playing, um, the rules say that if she hits a glass with a feather, it will break. And so I accept that um, in this scenario. All right. Now, the last stage is the formal operational stage. And here, uh, starting at around 11, 12 years old, the child can basically do any logical task that an adult can do. You still have them, I have to give the child time to think about it and learn about it. Uh, you got to teach them the right things. But this child can follow along uh, all the sort of more complex logical thinking that uh, uh, they couldn't do before around 11. But there are still problems with uh, the formal operational stage thinking. Uh, one of them is this idea of idealism. Okay. Um, in idealism, what's uh, happening is that the child now can imagine a complex world in their mind, but the complex world in their mind seems better, right? I can ask this child something about war or homelessness or some other complex idea, and the world in their mind seems better. And so they're gonna say, yeah, we should just stop homelessness, or we should just stop wars, because they, uh, to have a hard time understanding that the real world is harder to maneuver through and they're not going to think about the concrete world uh ideas like some people make money off of wars and uh some people who could you know help the problem with homelessness don't want to help because they don't want to use their money to help other people that seems too complex for them. And so they go, we should do it. We should, uh, uh, you know, stop war. We should stop homelessness because their ideal world interferes. And of course, the, depending on how old you are, this uh, is sort of more difficult to get over or e easier to get over. Um, I remember being like in around middle school and it was, uh, Halloween and uh, my cousin and I were just sort of playing out getting you know maybe trick-or-treating or something we're gonna go to a family party and when we got back to my cousin's house her mom had dressed up but she didn't have a costume so she painted her face green and she took tin foil and made like a weird witch's hat out of it and it was really cool but my cousin was very upset um, she was like, you're so embarrassing. I can't believe you're going to go out like that. This is a problem with idealism. In her mind, moms act a certain way. And her mom wasn't fitting in that ideal version of what moms act like. And so this was incredibly difficult for her to accept. And we do this with friends. We have this feeling of what a friend should act like. And when your friends don't act that way, you get very upset about it. Like, ah, you're not a good friend or whatever. As you get older, you're able to let go of some of those ideal versions. Essentially, you start to understand that the real world is real. And yes, I understand that I have an ideal world in my mind, but my ideal world in my mind isn't real. The real world is real. I would like to point out that this is why it's young people 
who are revolutionary, that it's young people who change the world. Because young people look at the world and go, there's stuff that's wrong with it. We should fix it. And they, you know, that the fact that the real world doesn't match their ideal world uh, infuriates them and gives them the energy to go out there and change the world. Whereas once you get older, you stop accepting your ideal world as important. And you go, my ideal world isn't important. The real world is important. And uh, you learn to balance that so well that sometimes, even though you know something is wrong, you just accept it. So, you know, idealism is a problem for logic, but a lot of times it is, you know, good for society in general. Let me talk about egocentrism and imaginary audience and personal fable in the next slide here. So um, in the formal operational stage, um, kids are still sort of egocentric. Now they're not egocentric like a, uh, a two-year-old is egocentric, where they don't really understand that other people have minds. Adolescents know that other people have minds. Adolescents know that other people have problems but they just get stuck on their own problems and they don't think about the other issues that other people are facing. And so mom might be struggling with paying for groceries, let's say, or she, you know, some expense came up and she's like, I don't have money for this. And she seems really upset. And teenager comes to mom and says, Hey, uh, mom, give me $20. I want to hang out with my friend. And mom will say, I just told you that I didn't have any money. And the adolescent, the teenager, will say, Oh my God, I do so many chores here. And I can't believe you're not going to let me go out. And you're not going to help me with this money. And they're very egocentric. If you were to stop this teenager and ask them the logic of, Does it make sense to ask mom for money when she just told you she didn't have it? They would be able to express that no, in fact, is not, you know, very intelligent of them, that, in fact, you know, they were wrong. But in the moment, especially, they're incredibly egocentric. And it's very difficult for them to put themselves in other shoes, other people's shoes, and think about um, other people's perspective there. Now, this also leads to two other issues. We call the imaginary audience and the personal favor. The imaginary audience is a belief that teenagers have that other people are looking at them. And so you probably remember this from high school uh, or middle school where you got a little stain on your shirt and you were sure everybody was looking at you and everybody was judging you. Or there was a teacher that you felt hated you personally and that they went home and thought about sort of ways to make your life miserable. But well, there was a teacher you really liked and that you thought that this teacher really loves you too. And the truth is that both those teachers probably didn't remember your name because uh, they had hundreds of kids and uh, they, it's hard for them to sort of think about 100 or 200 kids uh, every day. But yet when you're a teenager, you believe that you are the center of everybody's world and that everybody thinks about you and that everybody knows you and that everybody's either judging you or looking at you, you know, with pride or whatever. But uh, the next one there, the personal fable, is a feeling that everybody else um, uh, has not faced the world the way you have. You, uh, at the... Uh, excuse me, formal operational stage in adolescence especially, you believe that your feelings and your thoughts are unique, and that no one else has had them, that no one else has ever felt the way you feel. And so um, kids will say to mom, you have no idea what I've ever, you know, what I've, I've been through. Um, you never had to deal with anything like this. And there's mom telling you, Yes, I have. I was a teenager too. I've gone through stuff like this. That teenager has a real hard time imagining that. Now, I told you that there is this fifth level 
that we talk about today, which we call post-formal thought. Now, this was not one of Piaget's original levels. Piaget did not think about post-formal thought. But we now know that there are differences between kids who are just in their formal operational stage and kids who are at their post-formal, actually adults who are at their post-formal stage. Both of these, however, the uh, formal and post-formal are not automatic. And so you have to learn things to get through it. You have to sort of try to get over your idealism. That won't happen automatically. Uh, you have to um, try to get over your personal fable. You can live your entire life believing that everybody looks at you and that no one else has felt the way you felt. You have to try and get over that. And the post-formal is the same way. You have to sort of learn lots of things before you can try to get to this level. And so getting into post-formal thought isn't really about how old you are, but really how educated you are. Now, one of the main differences here, the one that I'm going to focus on, is the difference between dualistic thinking and relativistic, uh, relativistic thinking. When you are in your formal stage, there's still a lot of dualistic thinking. Kids think about uh, what is right versus what is wrong. Um, what is black versus what is white, up and down. Everything is sort of dualistic. And so a little kid, you're asking, talking to them about a war, and they'll ask you, who was the bad guy? Because it's almost impossible for a middle school kid, say a 10th grader even, to think about the world in form of relativistic thought, that the bad guys, quote unquote, had reasons that maybe weren't all bad, um, maybe they weren't bad at all, uh, and that uh, the good guys maybe did have some good reason for going into that war, but could have also had bad reasons too. A child in the formal state will not do that because of this dualistic thinking. Everything is sort of split into right or wrong. But as you get older, uh, you start to enter relativistic thinking and you start to understand the world um, in terms of, uh, well, you know, what is happening relative to that, you know, what, why did they do this, you know, it can't just be that one person is a villain and the other person is a good guy, what else, what is the other data that's happening there? Um, it's important to point out, that, again, that not everybody does this well, and so two people who are both well-meaning can come to very different answers depending on how well they do this. And also, because it's relative, two people could very well have all the data and be very smart and come up to very different answers. Now, it's around this time in your post-formal thought that you start to ask questions like, you know, what you know, how do I know that what I know is right? How do I know that what my teacher said is right? How do I know that what the book said is right? And now it's not good enough to say the teacher said it, the book said it, the authority said it. Now uh, adults here are starting to think about how do I know that it's right? How do I know that it's wrong? Um, Uh, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit uh, about different kinds of intelligences. Now, there's a, intelligence isn't one thing in psychology. Uh, there is not one definition for intelligence. And we could get, do like a whole chapter on just different theories about intelligence. But I do want to focus, because it's development, on how intelligence changes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, your crystallized intelligence is your uh, the breadth of your intelligence, how much you know now. So everything you've learned up until this point is part of your crystallized intelligence. And so therefore, the older you get, 
uh, the better your crystallized intelligence is. Your fluid intelligence, on the other hand, is your ability to process information rapidly. You might have seen this meme on the internet. It says, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. That's true for fluid intelligence. This is in part why sometimes you'll notice that you, as a young person, feel like you know things that adults should know and you kind of feel like you're way smarter than them sometimes. And it's, sometimes you are because of your fluid intelligence. Now, sometimes you are because you just know something that they don't know, and that would be crystallized. But what you will notice constantly is that your fluid intelligence is better. And so sometimes mom asks you to teach her something on the internet, and you teach her, and she starts saying, like, you go too fast. I need to write this down. You are doing things without telling me what you're doing. This is because mom, uh, her fluid intelligence has started to go down. As you get older, your fluid intelligence diminishes. And uh, so it becomes harder to learn new programs, uh, to learn new social constructs, right? Um, you might have heard your dad say something like, these kids with personal pronouns, and that's so silly, and, you know, why, when I was a kid, you were either a boy or a girl or something like that. This is because, they, again, his fluid intelligence has diminished. And so to you, as a young person, you go, yeah, some people are transgender, some people have a fluid sexuality or whatever. And uh, I got it, got it, I learned it, and now I can move on and figure out how to deal with that later on, uh, or, or as I continue to live. But for this hypothetical dad, he never learned that when he was young. And so now as an adult, he's maybe 60 uh, or older, and this new piece of information seems impossible to understand because it's, it takes uh, the ability to process information rapidly, to adapt to change. And this becomes very difficult for the older person. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that this older person doesn't know things. You know that sometimes you feel like you're so much smarter than your mom, but then a bill comes or you have to make an appointment or some other thing that requires crystallized intelligence, and you have to go to mom because mom knows how to do that or because dad knows how to do that. They're just different types of intelligences. Again, there's mom doing your taxes for you, but then you ask her to play some video game and it's like, oh, she can't even do this anymore. Um, it's so hard to learn, you know, the, the new uh, information. Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, an older mechanic when he was young, well, he was quick. He knew how to learn things quickly. And now that he's older, he has a lot of crystallized intelligence. He can still be a good mechanic. Uh, let's say he's 65 now. But now they're going to ask him to learn some computer things about the card. He's going to find that very difficult because, yes, his crystallized intelligence is incredibly large. He knows a lot of stuff, but his fluid intelligence is still very, uh, now has gone very low. Uh, and the older he gets, the harder it is for him to learn. All right, so everything I've been talking about uh, up until now has mostly to do with Piaget. Piaget um, stages of operations, and then I kind of uh, insert a few more theories in there. Now, the young guy you see next to him is uh, Vygotsky. And Vygotsky has a very different theory of development uh, than Piaget. For Piaget, the reason we get smarter, especially when we're young, is because of maturation. You your brain just develops, and so you get to the next level. And so Piaget would often um, talk about what he used to call the American question. He used to say that when he came to America to give lectures, Americans always asked him, how do I get my child to move through the stages faster? And Piaget said, 
You can't. You have to wait until the child's brain develops. Now, in the formal stage, you can get the child to learn things by teaching them more stuff. But to get uh, through the other stages, you just have to wait for their brain to develop. You can't rush it. Bykovsky doesn't talk about maturation. Bykovsky's theory is about social interactions and culture. And he says, yes, of course, there are certain ways to move a child forward uh, a little bit or that a child might be behind a little bit. That has to do with social interaction and culture, uh, family interaction. If mom and dad only talk about numbers and they're super into numbers, you know what? That kid is going to learn numbers faster. If uh, your culture um, requires following directions well, those kids are going to learn to follow directions well. In a culture where following directions isn't important, kids don't follow directions well. In my culture, uh, we don't put an emphasis on children following rules and following directions well. And so what you do, what you see, is that these little kids are running around and jumping around and tell them to sit down and they have a hard time doing it. But my culture puts a great emphasis on talking. And so you get very, very little kids who will have conversations with you like they're grown-ups. Um, and so, again, uh, you, you notice that there are cultural differences in how we learn, and uh, that obviously that depends on your social interaction. Now, um, Wyckowski talks about what we call zone of proximal development, and I'm going to start there. Your zone of proximal development is the difference between what you know now, the limit of your knowledge, versus the next thing you're going to learn. If the next thing you're going to learn is outside of your ability to, of what you know, then you can't learn that, right? Because you don't have the information. Um, and so, uh, even with all the logic in the world, even with all the thought in the world, it becomes almost impossible because you are at your limit. So let me give you this example. Um, you tell a little kid who knows how to add single digits to add the first answer, and they'll be able to do that. But if you ask probably a first grader uh, to do the next one, if you don't teach them, they'll never do it right. Uh, they'll do something like this. 7 plus 6 is 13, and then 1 plus 0 is 1. Obviously, that's wrong. But what you notice here is that this child would be at the zone of proximal development. That is, they are at the limit of their thoughts. And if you were to leave them here, they would never figure this out on their own. But if you scaffold the information, if you teach them, then they'll learn it quickly. It's not that this kid can't do it. It's that they can't do it on their own. And so you have to tell them, yeah, 7 plus 6 is 13, but that 1 in 13 is actually part of the tens place. And so you have to carry it and then add it to the tens place. And then now you get 23. You've got to teach this to a child a few times, give them a chance to sort of practice a lot, and then they're going to get it, and they're going to move on and never look back because they needed someone to scaffold the information. That's that next term there. That is, when someone who's older, probably more knowledgeable, helps to gap, bridge the information or the gap that um, is there uh, between what they know and what they need to know. Now, scaffolding is going to be complex, too. You should scaffold based on uh, each person individually, but of course that's hard. In a classroom like ours, we have 30 people in a classroom, and now I just got to teach to the 30 people, and I have to think about everybody else individually later. Uh, and then now we switch over to you know, online, and online, sort of, I'm just teaching in general, and I have to figure out how to make contact with you later or some of the little things. And, and so scaffolding it's difficult to do. It's not always so easy to do. Let me hit that last term, which is, uh, actually, let me I have a couple of slides here. The reason we call it scaffolding is because we're sort of gapping, uh, excuse me, bridging the gap 
um, you'll see the the scaffold there, the two stairs with uh, uh, sort of the bridge between them. That's what we would call a scaffold. It's always scaffold when we teach in the classroom. Mom and dad, you see that picture of the mom holding the baby. She's scaffolding there. This baby can't walk yet, and so she's helping the baby do it by giving them just enough information. In this case, by helping the child sit up or stand up. Now, that last term there, private speech, is something that Vykoski talks about. When you get a little kid, um, a two or three year old, they will often say things out loud as if though they're talking to somebody else, when in fact they're talking to themselves. And so they'll say things like, I'm going to put this block on top of the tower, or I'm going to change this to look this other way. And if you're not paying attention, it might seem that this child is talking to somebody else, um, when in fact this kid is talking to themselves. This child just hasn't internalized their thoughts into their mind, that um, uh, me, internal monologue. They haven't developed that. Uh, when a child is in elementary school, sometimes you'll see them mouth things to themselves so that it sounds like they're like uh, they're just not talking to anybody they're not making any sounds but their lips are moving as if though they're talking this is also a different form of private speech a more co uh, complex one now we still do private speech even as adults i have an internal monologue i'm thinking to stuff about stuff in my mind but sometimes if something is hard i'll start saying things to myself because I, uh, expressing it out loud just sort of helps me to focus. And so private speech isn't something that just children do, but it's something that children uh, do specifically because they can't do the more complex thing, the internal nominal. All right, now I'm switching gears here, uh, here and I'm gonna talk a little bit about moral development. And so uh, this is Colburn. So when you're reading about Colbert, Colbert is not talking about what's right and what's wrong. He's trying to figure out how do we know, how, what is the logical uh, mechanics that we're going through our, in our mind to figure out if something is right or wrong. And just like Piaget, he realized that it depends. It depends on how well you do uh, the mental work. If you're a child, you are probably at the pre-operational levels, uh, and you are only looking to, is there a way that I'm going to get punished, or is there a way that I'm going to get rewarded? And that's all a child cares about. And so they're about to do something, and they think to themselves, am I going to get punished for this? And if the answer is yes, then they imagine that what I'm about to do is wrong, and they don't do it. And if they think, am I going to get a reward? Yes, I'm going to get a reward. Then the answer must be uh, that this, whatever I'm doing, is right. Now, if you're stuck at your pre-conventional stage uh, long, too long, if you're uh, in elementary school, late elementary school, uh, definitely middle school or high school or older, uh, then you're getting in trouble all the time. Uh, if you're an adult at the pre-conventional level, then there's a good chance that you're a criminal because all you care about is, am I going to get a reward or am I going to get punished? And if I can figure out a way to just end up with the reward and no punishment, then I just accept that what I'm doing is right, even though everybody else knows that what I'm doing is wrong. And you'll hear people sometimes say things like, well, it can't be wrong. He ended up, whatever, with the money. Or she ended up going on the vacation. So what she did must have been right. Um, that's a pre-conventional way of thinking. At the conventional stage, you're either thinking about social groups, your social group specifically, um, uh, or what are the law, uh, what is, uh, who is in charge uh, in order to determine what is right or wrong. So if you're only talking about social groups, then you're trying to be in this good boy, good girl mentality. 
Um, I want my teacher to think of me as a good boy. Because so I'm going to do the things that my teacher wants me to do. I want mom and dad to think of me as a good girl. Because so I'm going to do the things that mom and dad want me to do. Again, though, once you get older, if you are still in this stage, it might present problems. Because in this stage, um, your, uh, excuse me, if your social group isn't mom and dad, it's your friends, then all of a sudden, what's right and wrong changes. And you'll see this if you've ever been in a middle school. A little kid, a middle school kid, uh, will do something wrong. The teacher is scolding the child, and the child will say something like, I don't understand why you're so mad. Everybody else is laughing. What this child is really saying is, my social group thinks that what I did was right. And so therefore, what, what I did must have been right. So why are you mad? This child can't understand that other people uh, don't care about your friends. They don't care about your social group specifically. They are looking about uh, uh, other rules. Now, in the law and order, these people are not going to get into a lot of trouble. They're not going to do weird things like, uh, you know, do something wrong and think that it's right, unless that thing that they did wrong isn't a law. So uh, all these people care about is what's the law, what are the rules, who's in charge. Whoever is in charge has to be right. And so people uh, will say uh, things like, um, if uh, you smoke marijuana, that's wrong, and you should go to jail. And you might say to them, wait a second, but that person you're talking about has cancer, and they're smoking marijuana for their chemo or for their pain. And somebody who's stuck in that conventional law and order state will say, it doesn't matter, it's against the law. Uh, uh, again, because they only think about what the law or the authority figures that. At the post-conventional level, you're uh, now not thinking about the law or the authority figure uh, to determine what's right or wrong. You don't care about that anymore. Because you start to determine that, in fact, some laws aren't very ethical. Um, and the authority figure can be unethical. In other words, you've developed a mental process for trying to understand why something is right or wrong. And so killing isn't wrong just because somebody said it was, the law said it was uh, wrong, but because you have these other ethical standards like don't hurt others or do no harm, uh, for example. You have started to ask yourself, why is this rule important in society? And of course, one of the things you'll start to notice is that some rules benefit some people while hurting others. And you start to go, hey, that rule, that law is unethical. Um, where someone who's still at the law and order stage will not be able to follow that logic. They're going to go, of course, it's it's the rule. Of course, we have to act this way. The authority figures that we have to act this way. But at the uh, post-conventional level, you're thinking bigger. You're thinking about why should this rule stand. And you'll notice that there are two stages underneath. The first one is the social contract. The idea is that I do what's right because I also expect other people to act right too. And if we both act right, the society will be better. You also notice that I wrote the phrase, the lesser of the two evils. Because uh, sometimes your ethical standards interfere with each other. Let's say someone needs to rob a Walmart because they don't have formula for their baby and they can't pay for it. And um, you might say, it's wrong to steal because it doesn't belong to you. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. You're taking away somebody else's livelihood. Um, uh, these are ethical reasons for why it's not okay to steal. But you might also think to yourself, it's also important 
that we feed the baby. And yeah, you might have ethical standards like a baby shouldn't go hungry. Society should make a way to help babies get the nutrition they need. But in this situation where, let's say a woman is going to steal some baby formula, these two sets of ethics have interfered with each other. If you're at the social contract level, you're going to choose the lesser of the two people. You're going to say to yourself, you know, yeah, stealing is bad, but feeding a baby is more important, more urgent, let's say. And so therefore, in this situation, yeah, this person should probably steal the formula. That's not so bad. There's a problem with the lesser of two evil idea. Is that what you think is the lesser of the two evils may not be the same thing that I think is the lesser of two evils. And so I might think, um, yeah, we should feed babies, but uh, if you steal formula, if everybody steals formula, then uh, that company is going to go bankrupt and then no one will have formula. And so now, because of my own thinking, uh, I now think about uh, the lesser of two evils as being different. So you and I are at the same level, but we're thinking at different, uh, we come up to two different answers. Now, the last stage is what we call the universal principles. The truth is that no one really thinks at this level, not naturally. You can do it when you're smart enough. You can do it, but you can do it like on paper. The example I always give is like, it's like calculus. People can do calculus, but the truth is that 99% of people have to do calculus on paper. They can't do it just in their head. Um, and the same thing is true with universal principles. Most of us, let's see, that's not true. Some people can do it. In fact, most of us can't do it. The majority of the world will never get into the post-conventional level. They get stuck at law and order. But if you're smart enough, you can get into the social contract and you can do universal principles, but usually on paper. And so even people whose job it is to be at the universal principles often fail at it. So first of all, what is the universal principle? Is your ethical standards, you never break them. Uh, and so, yes, we, excuse me, the woman should be able to uh, feed her baby, but also she can't steal. Neither of those can be broken. And so now you have to come up with a plan as to how we fix this. How do we make sure that both of these things happen? No one steals anything and the baby gets fed without uh, breaking our ethical standard. And that's very difficult. Um, and of course, imagine if you found $10 on the floor and you now went, okay, so what are my ethical standards? If I keep the money, will I break them? What are my ethical standards? Yeah, probably. What if I give it to uh, lost and found? Will I break one of my ethical standards? Yeah, probably something about responsibility or, uh, you know, making sure that somebody else doesn't steal it or somebody else will do something wrong. And go, well, what if I give it to a homeless person? Well, now am I being uh, ethical towards the person who lost the money? It, you could imagine how if you tried to be at the universal principles for every ethical quandary in your life, you would never move. You would always be stuck. And so most people just don't do this. And again, all you have to do is open up the newspaper and read through the newspaper and see how a lot of people fail to do the ethical thing. Uh, even people whose job it is, judges, lawyers, uh, doctors, teachers, these people are expected to act ethically and they fail all the time. Now before uh, we end here, I want to show you some of those news articles. And so here's one. Uh, this gentleman was uh, doing uh, some sexually harassing uh, a person or sexually assaulting, I should say, a teenage girl on a bus. And he got caught. He went to the judge, and the judge um, didn't sentence him to jail. 
and uh, within uh, within a few days he did it again. When he got caught again, um, he just said, "Oh, I thought it was funny um, to do it." What's happening to this person? I want to uh, come back down. Is that they're at the pre-conventional level, right? This guy didn't get uh, punished and quite possibly was getting some sexual pleasure from doing this. And so therefore he was kind of getting a reward. Uh, and so he said, what I'm doing can't be wrong. I didn't get punished for it. And so he went ahead and did it again, even though um, he, uh, everybody else who's reading this goes, this guy with this that I did was absolutely not okay. Now, uh, here's another story. Uh, or actually two different stories. The couple you're seeing on the left, um, the woman's parents murdered her husband. The husband is the gentleman in the picture. And the reason they murdered him is because he's from a different caste system than the woman is. He's from a lower caste system. And the family didn't accept that, and they killed him. Now, what's interesting about this story is that when you ask the people around uh, around the story whether or not the, they think the father should go to jail, by the way, the girl pressed charges against the father, the people here say things like, no, the father shouldn't go to jail. The father just did what was expected of him. What these people are talking about is that conventional level, social groups level. They're saying, uh, the father did what the social group expected of him. That is, stop his daughter from marrying someone from a different caste. And in fact, they'll go on to say, the girl should get in trouble. Because it was the girl who broke the social rules. She married someone outside of her caste, and then she pressed charges against her own father. And what they're saying is, she's the one breaking the social group standard. She's the one who should get in trouble. Now, the woman on the right, her husband was being sex was sexually abusing her children. And so she divorced him. Now, in her church parish, um, the husband asked for forgiveness. And so the uh, parish, uh, the church, uh, told the woman that she should forgive him too, and that she should take him back. And of course, the woman said, no, he was sexually abusing my children. And so the church threw the woman out of the church. Now, again, what's happening here is at conventional level, social groups level. They're saying the man did what he was supposed to do to fit back into the social group. But you are not doing the rules of the social group. The woman is not following the rules of the social group. In this case, taking her husband back. And so therefore, she's the one that's doing something wrong. And the husband is not doing anything wrong. You can see uh, the problem there. Now, um, at the uh, conventional level, uh, the, the law and order, sorry, I have to jump around a little bit here. Um, the law and order sometimes still prevents uh, problems or creates problems as well. I told you that most of the time these people are not getting in trouble, uh, but they still do things that are a little weird. So, for example, let's say a cop murders a little kid, and you'll hear people say things like, well, the little kid must have been doing something wrong because the cop shot him. You might say, no, we've seen the evidence. The little kid didn't do anything wrong. And somebody at the law and order state will say, he must have done something wrong. If he hadn't done something wrong, the cop would have shot him. You see that this person is stuck in that law and order stage. In the right, you see uh, a clipping about uh, uh, children who have been abused by uh, priests. And unfortunately, one of the things that happens is that the, uh, the parents, when they figure out that someone is abusing their children, they go to the priests and say, hey, some of you are abusing my children. What should I do about that? And then they just do whatever the priests say, because the priest is the authority figure. And so the priest must be right. 
And sometimes the parent will go as far as to say to the child, you did something wrong. You must have done something. That's why the priest did that to you. Or you're a liar. The priest would never do that because the priest is the good guy. You're the bad child. You're the bad senior. In fact, in this um, uh, article, um, the gentleman you see there, he was abusing the child, and he says that the uh, the priest told him, go ahead and tell. No one's going to believe you. Your mother and father already know about this, and that's why they sent you to me. In other words, the priest in this case was preying on the fact that the parents saw him as the authority figure, and they were not going to believe the child over him. Uh, here you see another version of this. Um, the video, this is a video you might have seen on the internet where uh, some cops are looking through a cancer patient's room for marijuana and the cancer patient is telling them, I have cancer. And the cops say to them, it doesn't matter. The law here says you can't have it. And so it doesn't matter that you're literally in chemo. If we find it, we're going to take you to jail. Um, this is a problem with somebody who is stuck in their law and order state. Now, to be fair to the cops, they just they have to do their job. Um, but uh, from an ethical perspective, in this case, it is the cops who are wrong because the cops are following a rule that is unethical in this scenario. Okay. Um, uh, what you're seeing here uh, is something that happened uh, sort of late 90s. This was the Enron. Enron was you know, they traded uh, you know, stocks and things like that. And um, they uh, were doing things with you know, people's, uh, uh, people's money. And what you see here is uh, an actual email that was sent back and forth between some of the traders. And you see Greg there saying, um, called, called lies, it's all how well you can weave these lies together. Sherry, all right, so, um, and Sherry says, I feel like I'm being corrupted now. Uh, no, this is marketing, he says. Okay, it's not as bad as trading. Um, he said, yeah, yeah, it's true. That. What's happening here is kind of a combination of both. This is the social group, and so Sherry knows that what she's doing is wrong. But she just accepts it because of the social group, because these are the rules of marketing. And she said, and Greg tells her, you know, traders do even worse things than we're doing. Of course, what they're doing is still unethical. Okay. And then I'm going to show you one of the post conventional here. These are what sometimes people call ecom terrorists. They're blocking um, uh, some lands so that a company can't, you know, uh, do something, you know, make a pipeline uh, or something like that. Sometimes eco-terrorists will free cows or uh, do other things like that. These people are at the social uh, contract board. They have a problem with ethical issues, right? Yes, we shouldn't invade other people's land, but also these people are ruining the environment, these companies, or they're hurting cows. And to these individuals, they're going, this ethical standard don't hurt cows, or this ethical standard don't pollute the environment, is more important than the ethical standard of don't trespass. And so they will get in the way, uh, they'll make these companies lose a lot of money, because they are following their ethical standards. So I want to pause here uh, for uh, cognitive development. And there is one more video for chapter 9, so please be on the lookout.